So welcome to the talk, uh, Future of AI and Part 2, Artificial General Intelligence, by two of my most favorite people, Brian Catanzaro and David Luan. I welcome you on the stage. I will introduce you. So David, CEO and co-founder at ADAPT, and their company is building uh, AI agents for knowledge. Um, previously, he was VP of engineering and o at OpenAI. And he saw the research on language, supercomputing, reinforcement learning, safety, and policy. And before that, he co-led a team at Google Brain where they ship GPT, Clip, and DALI. Welcome, David. Thanks. And Brian uh, is the VP of applied deep learning research team at NVIDIA. Uh, they work on multimodal language modeling, chip design, audio, speech, graphics, and vision, and continue to find uh, practical new ways to use AI for NVIDIA's products and workflows. While at NVIDIA, Brian has helped create pix 2 pic XHD, DLSS, Megatron, QDNN, Pascaline, WaveGlow, and DeepSpeech. Welcome. I'll let you guys take it from there. Well, it's so great to see everyone here. Welcome to GTC. Um, it's uh, been a while since we had one in person, and uh, it feels incredible to see you all here. So thank you for coming, and I hope we're going to have an interesting discussion today. Um, David and I are friends, and we're just going to be chatting about um, the work that, that we're each doing and, and uh, where we think it's going. Um, hopefully, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Yeah, super great to uh, super great to be here with you, Brian. I feel like you've done so many uh, anchor contributions to the field, so I think this is going to be a lot of fun to get to uh, grill you a little bit about some of the <laughs> things you um, you believe over the next forty five minutes or so. Well, um, don't grill me too hard. All right, that's <laughs> good. So I guess just to start off, I think um, you know Nvidia, like you have um, driven Nvidia's AI efforts for quite some time. On, um, and I'm curious, like. Um, how would you describe the goals of NVIDIA's like AI training and, and research programs that you've been overseeing? Yeah, um, it, it turns out that uh, NVIDIA uh, is working on our own AI efforts and um, uh, is something that I'm very excited about and something that I'm hoping uh, is going to continue to develop. Um, and I think there's two really strategic reasons why NVIDIA is building its own AI. Um, the first has to do with the nature of accelerated computing. So um, uh, the, the value that NVIDIA provides when we sell systems uh, for AI is in speed. And um, having that delivered to the engineers and researchers around the world that are creating AI requires us to understand uh, the process of creating pretty deeply. There's a lot of um, things about the structure of networks, um, how do we use low precision arithmetic, um, sparsity, um, how do we deal with networking and um, all of the various software stacks, compilers, libraries, frameworks, communication in the network, um, systems like Grace Hopper where we have um, CPUs that are coupled to GPUs in new ways and um, all of these things, uh, there's so many choices and the soul of NVIDIA's work as an accelerated computing company is, is to make those choices but that requires us to actually understand what, what is um, being accelerated uh, really deeply. I always like to joke that um, accelerated computing actually means decelerated computing for almost everything. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, if you just say, hey, I'm going to make a computer and it's going to be fast, th that's not really saying much. All computers try to be fast, right? Um, so the thing that makes uh, accelerated computing different is that it's specialized. But then that question of what do we specialize for becomes essential. And um, you know, the only way that we can build the systems of the future is to be building AI ourselves so that we understand uh, what's built. So that's the first reason. The second reason, I think, has to do with uh, the opportunities as, as AI develops around the world. Um, you know, I believe that AI is going to impact the world economy in every sector, in every company. Uh, but how is it going to do that? Because uh, there's a lot of um, specialized skills that need to be developed and, and also an enormous amount of compute and data and resources that get put into building AI. Not every company is going to be able to uh, invest in that. And when I think about NVIDIA and our business of supporting the world, you know, NVIDIA is able to partner with every company, old and young, uh, large and small, um, in 
finance or in consumer product goods or in technology, you know, we, we, um, we're able to help every company uh, incorporate technology into the beating heart of their business in a way that preserves their identity and, and uh, allows them to take advantage of their own unique ideas and market position to change the world. And I think in an era where AI is changing everything, um, it makes sense for uh, AI to be part of NVIDIA's platform. And so that's um, the second reason why we're developing AI. Um, so you have had a front row seat basically to um, the enormous gains just due to things like model scale over the last couple of years. Um, I'm curious, um, you know, um, actually zooming way out for the audience, I think a lot of people may be familiar, but you know, how do you think about scaling laws? Like what do they mean for, uh, what do they mean for, for, for AI? And do you think that like that's gonna continue to hold? Yeah, um, well, I've been betting on scaling AI now for 20 years <laughs> and it's been a good bet. You were one of the original GPU programmers way back in the day, right? Uh, yeah, it's um, a long time ago. Back when I was a grad student at Berkeley, um, I was doing machine learning on GPUs and, and you know published a paper at ICML back in 2008 on using GPUs to train models so that we could scale them. And, and um, I actually got this response from a bunch of people at, at ICML, this machine learning conference. They were like, what are you doing here? Like, everything that we're doing here is uh, new mathematical formulations of machine learning that allow experiments to be run, you know, new kinds of experiments to be run uh, by a grad student on a laptop. And the data sets that, that at the time people were using might have like a few hundred data points in it and they might be like a few dimensions big. So it was, it was an era of small scale machine learning and there was still lots of interesting things happening. But, you know, I believed that scale in data and compute was going to uh, change the world. And, and now looking back, I think that's been clear. Um, but it's also kind of, um, a disappointing feeling for many many people working in AI. This idea that data and compute is all you need, it's all you need, <laughs> because like we want to believe actually what we need is more PhDs in in probability theory because that's really fun. It's really fun to work on probability theory, but the idea that actually we just need enormous computers and enormous data sets uh, uh, that that doesn't feel as great. But um, I, I think we need both. Obviously, I, I love PhDs in, in probability theory, but um, I but I but I feel like the the foundation that has been moving AI forward for the last several decades has been scale. And I don't think that we're uh, seeing the end of that yet. Yeah, I feel totally the same way, by the way. It's like, um, I this is talk I oftentimes give that uh, basically outlines the different eras of deep learning. Like everything before 2012, I loosely just lump in a prehistory. And then like 2012 to 2017 was like you and your three best friends write a research paper that changes the world. <laughs> and after 2017 though, like after Transformer, after learning how we map um, uh, these architectures really efficiently to hardware, um, then it's dr just really become a data and scale game. And sometimes people ask me, you know, um, should I go, uh, should I go leave and get a PhD? Should I go um, think about like uh, how I, I can make new algorithmic advancements? I definitely think some people should uh, continue to consider that kind of stuff. But, but on net, like even if you go back and look at the initial AlexNet paper, right? Like people thought that that was really an idea shift, but it was really like, like Alex Krzyzewski sitting in a corner figuring out how to map like convolutional neural networks efficiently to the 580. Right, the like two of them actually. The two of them. He was very pioneering in the sense <laughs> that he like r built a neural network specifically for the system that he had, which had two GPUs. So he had to like partition it in this very strange way. And the systems work underlied, underlay the, the, the result that, mm -hmm. that he got. And that's, I think it's been true for so many big, big results. Like um, back when I was at OpenAI, when we did GPT-2, um, when Alec Radford and I were writing the paper for that, um, we uh, had long sections about you know, all the evaluations and, um, and uh, like um, a short section about how we unified all these tasks into just predict the next token. But the modeling section was like a paragraph long. It's like we used a vanilla decoder only transformer <laughs> with like th these couple of configurations and we're just sitting there being like the academic community is going to roast us because they'll say this is no novelty. Um, and for and they time. did. And they did. And they, they did. did. And I just like keep on seeing this happen over and over again that like the new metagame that people need to play to actually get advancements in AI is like poo pooed by the current incumbents. Um, and I think we're seeing that again in this era. I mean, this is a little little different from um, from some of the more uh, broad platforms work that you all do. But like like for us at least, one of the things that we really believe in at Adept is 
is that um, this next era of AI is actually going to be about getting product right and doing the correct co-design of product and the research objective and having a lot of new ideas and research actually flow from what doesn't work for customers. And I feel like that's actually another change from the way that like, for example, like my old team at OpenAI or my old team at Google Research would think about the problem. Yeah, hey, can we back up a second and, and you explain like what is Adept and, and what is Adept doing? Yeah. Oh, so Adept is kind of a is a is an interesting company. We're configured a little differently from the um, from the other s sort of startup labs that you all know about, like OpenAI and Anthropic and and Mistral and stuff like that. Um, what we do at Adept is we actually have a um, we have a broader north star uh, that's both a product and research north star, and it's can we train an AI agent that can do anything a human can do on a computer. So um, how can we build models that don't just read and write text or understand images, but use them to be able to, um, give it a natural language instruction, um, uh, do whatever end steps on your, on your machine with the software that you already use at work to go achieve that goal. So like simple things like, you know, take this invoice that showed up in my email and put it into QuickBooks or find six different ways that I might be able to, uh, to plan out this particular trip that my team needs to go on and have the model actually just actuate your machine like a human to go get that stuff done. I think what we see a lot is that, um, is that like, you know, as enterprises have adopted these, um, these, uh, these LLMs in particular, right? People always use them for summarization, text generation, those things seem to work. And the moment those things start working in a company, they're like, okay, great. How can I actually hand off whole workflows from my team um, to a model such that they could be augmented? And uh, um, that's basically the problem that we've been trying to solve. In order to solve workflows, you need to be able to solve things that look much more like agents, which um, I'm really excited about because if you start working on agents, all of a sudden you get to bring all the richness of the like like broader RL literature, all the work that happened at DeepMind um, in the mid 2010s around like uh, beating humans at Go and all that stuff. You get to bring those to bear in the LLM era, which is really cool. Wow. Um, I feel like what you're articulating is uh, a future where humans are being augmented by these models, where like uh, the goal of these models is to, to help people get things done. I don't know, how, you, how do you think about the way that humans and, and agents are going to coexist? Yeah, this is like uh, a, a really strong part of what I really believe in from a mission perspective is that like you could frame um, work in this space as being, hey, how do I um, just outperform people and then replace them at tasks? But I believe really strongly that the much more interesting and correct path for us to focus on is exactly as Brian said. It's like, how do you build AI systems that are actually here to, 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 to augment people? And I think the line there becomes like, the way that we make that happen is we work on tasks that are like 80% doable by these models on purpose because that way you get this 20% of human supervision where they oversee what the models do. Like for example, like one of our customers is a, is a, is a, is a logistics company that uses Adept basically to um, handle the life cycle of containers. You know, um, people on their team log onto their platform and there's like um, dozens or hundreds of shipping containers that need to be tracked and to figure out like have they cleared customs, all that stuff that's like entirely done by hand now. But um, like uh, the way that they now use Adept is Adept in the background basically now goes and visits all the places, uh, uh, all the different software tools required to understand where those containers are, and then gives the, the human team a really easy way to supervise whether or not Adept did a great job on this whole mass of shipping containers. And so by doing this, um, we've basically changed the role where humans are able to solve the harder problems like, okay, this thing didn't clear customs, we have to go fix it, um, and then also gives our model feedback about how it can do better next time. And so I think like building these like data, data flywheels, these data loops, um, by combining the, the product side with the actual AI R&D side, uh, just helps your models get way better. Because if you're just working in a pure replacement world, um, by definition, it's a lights off automation process. You're not getting feedback and your models never get smarter. So I think this is also a better way to get stronger capabilities as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, you know, on that note, one of the big challenges always is like, is like, I think everyone aspires to build data loops, right? Because o over time these days, as you continue to scale up these big models, people pour huge amounts of compute into these base LLMs and they get smarter. Um, there's still this giant missing piece of what's specific to you and your company and your, and your customers. And so like, we've been talking a lot about, um, how do you actually be able to, um, 
like what is the role of like privacy and private data and all that stuff and i know you've been thinking a lot about that i'm curious i'm curious how you think that's going to play out over the next couple of years yeah well i think we are reaching the end of an era right now with large language models which is the end of sort of easily accessible tokens you know to train one of these um, large language models takes um, on the order of tens of trillions of tokens of text. And it turns out that um, that's about the number of tokens that humanity has written, <laughs> at least that's available that we can get to on the internet in every language, you know, um, all, all put together, including programming languages. And, um, and uh, so this is an absolutely astonishing amount of data, right? So we're, we're training these models uh, basically to read the entire uh, recorded output of humanity's intellectual work. Uh, and then uh, we're hoping that the model, after reading all of that, is going to remember some of it and is going to be able to use it to reason to solve problems. Um, and the fact that that actually works in some ways is uh, kind of surprising. Uh, it's, wild. It's, it's really exciting, you know, and it's one of the things that, um, you know, I, sometimes I, I wake up in the morning, I'm just like pinching myself like, wow, I can't believe that this like crazy thing that we <laughs> as computer scientists tried to do of like find all text that humans ever wrote and then train a model on it that that actually leads to a thing that can help people solve problems if it's if it's fine-tuned and, and supervised in the right way yeah. um, so so we've 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 uh, been pushing this you know for the past few years um, really since I guess GPT-2 I think is GPT-2 really kicked off that um, search for for larger and larger uh, data sets and models and you know, the progress has been uh, really incredible, as you know, but uh, there just isn't more text to read, right? Like, there's, there's, just, not, there's just not more. And so, uh, but yet, we know that our models are not actually done, right? There are many problems that our models right now just have no hope of solving. And I, I love that you brought up the customs example, right? So, <laughs> the, like, getting something through customs, it doesn't seem intellectually very difficult, but actually, it's there's a lot of sophistication that you have to understand yep. how these different different systems work and the rules are written down in kind of vague ways and like there's negotiation that's happening and, and different companies have different rules so it's like there's no one size fits all procedure for getting that done that's right and so um it's clear to me that the future of these models has a lot more to do with the kinds of data that you're using to train the model or to supervise it to fine tune it right so we're going to need to um, teach the models very sp very specific things rather than the general thing of read the entire internet and then um, and then we're gonna uh, we're gonna do RLHF with you know or supervised fine tuning with a little bit of human feedback about like um, some pretty basic kinds of problem solving uh, that is gonna need to shift towards um, uh, something more specialized something more in depth um, and I think it's pretty clear that. Uh, uh, data quality and data, um, sort of the purpose of the data, is going to matter much more in the future than, than it has. And, um, you know, it today, I think it's true that the world's most valuable data is also the world's most protected data. Um, for example, like, if you think about my own personal valuable data, you know, like, we all have things that, that we protect, like maybe my text messages, you know, I wouldn't like those to be public, or my medical records, or my calls, uh, uh, you know, to, to my family members and friends. Um, and uh, yet, if there was a model that saw my life uh, in that detail, it probably would be a really great assistant for me, right? Yeah. Um, and so the most valuable tokens to me are also the most um, heavily guarded tokens. And I think that's true for businesses as well. So I think, um, you know, m my personal belief is that every business is founded on a secret. It's usually the kind of secret that you know, Jensen Huang can shout from the rooftops for 30 years, like, hey, accelerated computing is a thing. Um, and, but the world doesn't understand it, right? Like, the, that's the thing about a good secret, is that yep. even when you explain it, there's something about it that, you know, is unique. Like, you have a unique way of thinking about the world. You can explain it, but it's still yours. And other people think you're crazy, usually. They often think you're crazy. They don't understand, like, how this would matter. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I believe every company, not, not just tech companies, but um, every company uh, has something unique about it, uh, some secret, you know, that, that is kind of the core of the purpose of the company, its mission, or its market position, or the way that it goes about problem solving, or maybe culturally, you know, how, how is the company held together? These, these are enormously valuable, and yet they could never be um, 
public, right? So like yeah. the, the act of like um, exporting all of your most secret data, basically exposing the beating heart of your business to um, uh, uh, an agent uh, actually is, it requires a lot of, um, uh, uh, of sort of data provenance and also safeguarding because you know these models uh, as they as they learn mm -hmm. from this very valuable data they're going to become very powerful but then you know um, uh, the question is how are they going to um, how are we going to use them to augment the, the work that we're doing yeah. and so to me what that says is that um, we're going to be entering in an era of increased specialization where um, entities companies people are going to be um, able to use their own data that's very, very valuable, but very protected, and, and, and combine that with um, these models to make agents that, that are actually um, super useful. Yeah, I think that's, that's got to be the way it's, it's, uh, it's going to play out. Um, to just to layer on, um, layer on um, my own perception of how the last couple of years have played out in that, in that particular space, like I remember, um, I think back in maybe 2018-ish, um, I was at a I was at a bar in Noe Valley of this guy Dirk Kingma who invented the variational autoencoder. Really cool dude. Um, and we're we're just catching up on on the state of research. He had just um, left OpenAI to go to Google Research, um, and he was just like, you know, David, like, I feel like this whole behavioral cloning thing uh, has has a has a lo long way to run, and it might just end up working really well. And I was like, oh well, what do you mean? He's like, well, maybe the critical path to general intelligence isn't actually that you need to go solve this whole crazy RL problem and learn every possible behavior from scratch, including language from running simulated agents running around in virtual environments. Maybe the right answer is you just clone everything that people have ever done in their lives and throw all the weights of that into one model. And that's exactly what we're doing now, right? With, with LLMs, we're just doing that for text. With multimodal models, we're doing that for images and text or audio and text or, or all of YouTube and text. Um, we were just training these models that like simply just predict Given the, tr the, 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 the context so far, like what is actually going to be the most plausible thing a human in a similarly situated situation would have done? Um, and so it's really cool that that works at all, but I think there's a couple of corollaries to that, one of which is that um, these models are, one, only as smart as the smartest data in its training set, really. Like it has some generalization capabilities, but like, um, but like anything that is true new knowledge discovery under the training objectives we have right now are actually going to be penalized by the model, right? Because it doesn't match anything in the tr training distribution that you put in. And also these, are, these, are, um, the, uh, these models end up basically learning how to compress all the text or images or whatever that you put in to go train it on. So if you have a bunch of uh, crappy data, um, the model is just wasting so many parameters on, on that kind of thing, right? So I think the combination of those two things really point you I, to I add, I have a joke about that, which is like, we were training a model, this was probably five years ago, and like our model was diverging and we couldn't figure out why. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that um, we had downloaded some web pages where people were drawing pictures with like ASCII art and emojis. And <laughs> so we were like feeding those tokens into our model as if they were English tokens. And our model wasn't big enough to kind of understand that uh. this was a different language, a language of like ASCII art. Yep. And so it just exploded. So just like you know? P of like uh, pound sign was like extremely high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the model just couldn't, at the time, you know, five years ago, it could not learn how to draw ASCII art and learn the English language at the That's same tough. time. Yeah, it's so funny. I think I think like we we we've all sort of built up these like battle scars of like stupid uh, uh, like quantities of data thrown into these things. I remember for one of the GPTs, I forgot which one. There was just like turned out part of the corpus was just like pages and pages and pages of Canon printer serial numbers um, <laughs> that we hadn't done a good job of filtering out. Uh, it just it it really does not end. Um, and so that's actually why like like I feel like you know. Um, Going back to the, the the private data thing, right? Like, s um, part of the goal for for Adept is like, you know, we're training these agents to do work on your computer. We need to learn from the we need to learn from the smartest humans possible doing the hardest tasks. Because if you don't have that kind of data, which is not public data, it's not sitting around on the internet, then um, then um, your ba it's really hard to push the increased capabilities of your base models. Um, and so I think like. Well, you know, there's lots of uh, interesting work that you can now bring to bear on this particular domain in the agent space of controlling your computer that help you sidestep a, that a little bit. Because in the usual text LLM domain, you don't really have a simulator. Uh, and because you don't really have a simulator, you can't do as much 
interesting work like um like for example one of the things that we've been spending a lot of time thinking about is is, is self-play right so how can you train a model that can use your computer that can also scrutinize its own its own decisions and let you spend compute at at um, this sort of post-training time to collect new experiences about how you might do things on your machine and take the ones that are successful and train on those and and build loops like that um and um and one like in addition to like you know, solving these like specialized models with private data problems. The other set of problems I'm really excited about is that I think in the next year or two, we're just going to see tremendous gains to AI capability in the post-training step, not just in the pre-training step yeah. that people know and love today. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, uh, I, I do think that um, uh, the post-training step has already shown to be enormously important, right? Like if you, you just take a raw language model without doing SFT, RLHF, uh, trying to align it to, to human uh, preferences and, and give it some problem solving capability, it turns out that uh, the language model isn't actually nearly as helpful, right? And so I think we're seeing uh, a lot of, of uh, progress happening when we, we figure out how to make something that's generally smart, but then we specialize it to try to do a thing that's helpful, right? And then the, the question is, you know, how is that going to continue going forward? So, so I have kind of a, a spicy question for you, and I don't, I don't know the sure. answer to this question, but I, I have an opinion. But um, so, do you think that the way that these uh, problems are going to be solved is mostly going to be through general intelligence, or do you think it's mostly going to be through specialization? Or is that a stupid dichotomy, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't ask that question? No, I think it's a good. I think it's a good question. I feel like so. My experiences, at least, and and I'd love to, to 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 flip it on you after I give my answer on it. My experiences, at least, is that like the quality of your raw pre-trained model sort of sets the uh, sets the ceiling for behaviors yeah. and intelligence that you might yeah. see, regardless of what you do after the fact, right? So like you kind of want to make sure during pre-training stage that you have support for uh, in the training distribution for most of the tasks that you're going to care about downstream. And then I think about everything that happens after that is really like like teaching specialized rules, teaching specialized knowledge, teaching like, hey, in this, like collapsing the waveform of like, you know, in, in time, like in time step X, I could do one of N things because like in my training set, people did it N different ways to uh, like, hey, at my company, I do th this one particular way. So push up the likelihood of just like the next step according to that particular way. Um, I feel like that's really the role of everything that happens during the, during the post-training phase. So I think what's going to happen is like in the next couple of years um, to get state-of-the-art capabilities, not like necessarily like fast local capabilities, right? But to get state-of-the-art capabilities, every organization is going to need a combination of access to one of the few like true frontier models that has like just the highest level of intelligence possible with the private data that's like teaching that model the particular things that um, that are special to you and your task. Yeah. Um, so probably a combo. I'm curious. Yeah. What you think. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm generally aligned. One one of the uh, things that I really like thinking about is how multidimensional intelligence is. For example, I don't know how many of you love, let's say, Beyonce, right? Uh, obviously, iconic artist. Um, I believe that she has a special kind of intelligence. It's a really rare kind of intelligence, the way that she's able to understand other people and sort of cultural trends and then her own life experience and then synthesize that into a thing that captivates the attention of hundreds of millions of people around the world and thereby makes large amounts of money. Uh, this kind of intelligence is pretty rare, um, pretty useful. At least us humans, we resonate with this. Like a lot of our culture is driven by super unique forms of uh, intelligence. I, I would almost say like, not, not to say that um, these are aliens among us, but they're, they're certainly icons among us, right? Of, of people that just really have special skills. And, um, you know, I don't know what Beyonce's SAT score was. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm not actually very interested in that question, right? Um, it's, not, it's not directly relevant to the reason why she's so interesting and her work is so valuable. Now, um, I, I do think that like you said, having a, a, a more general, uh, a smarter, more general uh, intelligence, uh, it does place kind of a ceiling on the capabilities. Like if, you, if your model just isn't uh, very general and just doesn't know very much, it's, it's hard to get it to be really amazing at anything, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, so I do believe that uh, general intelligence is, is useful and, and we're gonna continue pushing that frontier. But, yeah. um, but my belief is that because intelligence is so multidimensional, 
I think there's probably eight billion different dimensions of intelligence because there's eight billion humans on the planet, you know? And I, I believe that, you know, there's something that I could learn from pretty much all of them. Um, and uh, I think that we're going to find out as we deploy AI to solve problems um, around the world that uh, there are so many different forms of intelligence that uh, we're going to build in order to solve these problems. And I think that's, that's going to be pretty exciting. Um, but one of the one of sort of the uh, uh, implications of that, which I think goes along with the work that you're doing at Adept, is that I think um, replacing people isn't actually very interesting, right? Because um, there's there's just if you have this thing that's like so multidimensional and so complicated, um, uh, making something general that that just all of a sudden does everything, I I just don't see that that's um, that's where we're going to go, because I think the problem is, is much more complex than that. I think it's way more complex. I, I, I mean, one of my coworkers um, actually has a really good analogy for this, which is that like the best way to build AI that is really good at augmenting people is to think about it kind of more like a cognitive tool and cognitive technology than a robot. Like in the same way that, you know, I um, like our brains changed when we evolved like writing and we evolved uh, when we when we invented mathematics. Um, I think, um, and like similarly, like our brains changed when we were able to offload the majority of facts to like our phones and to learn how to use calculators, right? Um, I think the same thing is going to happen as we build these increasingly sophisticated AI agents, right? Because then you have like another set of things that you don't really need to do, so you can spend your own limited representational capacity learning how to do something else. Then you sort of co co evolve this like like joint way of thinking with these new models as they get smarter and smarter. And I think like th that's probably how this is going to play out. And I think most people don't think that that yet and are spending all their time figuring out how do I take like in the same skeuomorphic way we saw with like with like early like touch devices, right? Like people are still in the mode of like figuring out how the current analogies we have today could, could apply to this world when you have smarter and smarter AI agents. When what you really need to do is you actually need to go revisit those interaction principles from scratch. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. This is one of the reasons actually why uh, I'm, I continue to be excited about the omniverse, as we call it at NVIDIA, um, or virtual worlds in general, is that I think um, a, a lot of the most interesting ways that people are going to be solving problems with AI are going to happen in a virtual world, um, as opposed to um, the skeuomorphic, like, oh, how do I, you know, uh, interact with uh, my phone today, or, or you know, how, how do I work today? Yeah. So, like, how do we how do we build agents that are able to kind of bridge that gap? I think is is really interesting. One hundred percent. Taking it down maybe a, a different direction. I'm really curious, Brian, what you think about you know if you go look at uh, this broader north star of either generalized AI agents or um, or if we want to if we want to call it AGI AGI. What do you think is um, what do you think are the remaining big open research problems, like the stuff that isn't just, uh, you know, scale these things more, put more data in them. Yeah. Um, do you think there's anything that's left? Um, I, I do. Um, I, I think um, fundamentally the way that we're doing inference today doesn't really allow for the kind of problem solving that we need to be able to do because, um, because it's fairly linear. So, you know, most of the time when these models are actually being deployed, uh, you ask them a question, they provide an answer. But I don't know, uh, may maybe I'm anthropomorphizing it a little bit, but um, back when I was uh, in school and I was taking a test, you know, the answers to some questions, sure, you just write it down. The answers to other questions, they could take a thousand times more thought. Um, and right now, it's really difficult at inference time for our models to, to be able to allocate compute. Mm, you mean like adaptive compute during yeah. time? Yeah, it seems like we need, we need like ex the ability for these models to be much more introspective about um, the outputs they're generating, and that involves allocating compute in different ways. And like, if you need to spend a thousand or a million times more compute to generate one token than the others, then uh, we should figure out how to do that. Um, do you feel like things like all of the chain of thought prompting related tricks and stuff like that or uh, are a way to approximate that or I think it's a start I think it's a start but you know those aren't widely deployed right now I think one reason is because they're so expensive 
Um, and so I, I kind of, you know, the going back to the bitter lesson that, that we spoke about at the beginning, I think we haven't really seen how the bitter lesson applies to inference as much as uh, to training. You know, most of the time when we talk about the bitter lesson, we're talking about how do we um, build frontier models and, you know, just dump insane amounts of, of, of training into them. But I think actually the, um, there's going to be some, an analog of that to the deployment phase. And um, the research for that, I, I think, uh, is pretty nascent. Interesting, interesting. So when you say bitter lesson for deployment phase, it'll be like like getting rid of handcrafted tricks during inference time to get the base model to have already learned sort of the right things to do during inference? Or do you mean something else? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking something about um, uh, th th there's going to be there's going to be some connection to the amount of compute that we can spend uh, on inference and the smart of the models that we produce and I, I think that yeah. that's the underlying thing that I'm that I'm getting at the the way of you know how we actually um, implement that I think um, that's where the research is gonna have to go I mean there's there's a lot of papers about this kind of topic right now but I don't think anybody's um, fully cracked it yet and I think we're gonna see some pretty amazing things that come out from um, uh, much more compute intensive inference I completely agree with that I feel like um, when I think about post training uh, you know, there's there's straight up, you know, how do you get the models to be smarter during inference time? But then there's also just after you're done pre-training the thing, how do you use the artifact you just created to go actually improve the model itself before you even deploy it? And I think like that second bucket is going to be huge. Like, yeah, I feel like this com it, it doesn't have to be RL, but this combination of like these base models that have a lot of instincts that have been honed into them through the pre-training phase um, with um, you know like trying to get these things to actually understand the, the, the reward signal of the task you're actually trying to solve, and then be able to spend compute to push up numbers on that particular reward signal. And we see the early signs of this with things like RLHF, right? But like, yeah. that's like, we're, we're at the very, very surface of the full scope of research and what's possible down that particular path. And I think over the next like year or two, we're gonna see, um, and we're, we're already seeing in the papers, but like, we're gonna see like true, like discontinuous gains that um, that happen when you're uh, when you're able to to like to like like hook up RL and or search um, yeah. in all sorts of different environments with with these base models. I mean, just even thinking about like w like within the agents domain on your computer is one example, but also like all this excitement around uh, around like universal uh, foundation models for robotics. Like that's another great example of how um, you know right now we're doing the pre-training phase for that, but then there's a very obvious second step. Uh, that happens after you've done the pre-training to make those models see, like amazing controllers and amazing planners for all sorts of robotics tasks. I think it's gonna be so cool. Yeah, I I totally agree, and I and I feel like there is a there's a bootstrapping that's happening, which you know this is a, a classic technology development cycle that we're going through, where you know um, you know like Moore's law for many years was powered by semiconductors, right? So like you needed to have better semiconductors in order to build the machines to build the next generation of semiconductor and I think that we're seeing that um, with AI right that the you know one of the most interesting <laughs> things that um, I'm excited about doing with our foundation models is, is using them to understand our data set synthesize new data sets train uh, much smarter next-gen foundation models because I do think there's a there's a loop that's happening yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think we maybe see the early stages of that by using the models as like data filters or yes, that's yeah, right. augmenters and stuff like that. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, we're running out of time. So um, I, I think maybe just one more question. Like what's something that you're excited about that you think everybody else is not excited about yet? Oh, that's a good one. That's a, that's a good, uh, good, um, hmm. So let's see. Well, I think I mentioned a little bit about, um, I mentioned a little bit about, you know, how uh, I think right now so much energy and so much effort is going into multimodal foundation modeling as it should, right? Because, you know, it's clear multimodal models have sort of uh, have sort of taken over as the default model family, right? Like, I think in some time people will just always be bundling all this stuff in and then soon we're going to add audio in that, soon we're going to add video, soon like any other like... Uh, all the tokens. All the tokens, yeah, just all the tokens in, in one particular model. I think actions, like just like trajectories of behavior, like are gonna also be added into that. And now you just have this base thing that uh, can itself decide how it wants to allocate its capacity to learn how to model all those things. So that's all great. I'm really, really excited about that. 
but um but uh, and i think that's actually going to be the majority of like of like new advancements over the next couple of years but there's these like domain specific things that i am also very excited about even though i don't work on them like we just talked about robotics but um one of the ones one of the projects that i uh that i helped uh, fund at google um was uh, uh done by our friend Nal, who uh, and his team up up in amsterdam in europe um but they um what they did was they trained a model uh basically to outperform um the best uh, 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 scientific simulators at weather prediction. And all they did was they just turned the whole planet into these like small cells, each of which is represented by a couple of numbers that's like the current precipitation level and humidity and temperature and all these different things. And then, uh, and then just treated it as like a, like, a, okay, I now have this like tensor and I just need to predict the tensor at the next time step, the tensor at the next time step. And let's forget about any physical modeling. And it turns out if you just do this, you now have this sort of like universal, like, like Earth model of these of these variables that actually outperforms the, the physics simulator up until some amount of time. Like that's just so cool. Um, there's so many other domains where you could just literally say, hey, I have this infinitely flexible input output engine. Let me just model it and see what happens. But I'm curious yeah. what you think. Fantastic. Um, well, I, I wanted to put in a plug again for uh, virtual worlds and, and Omniverse. I think that um, we're gonna find that uh, some of the most interesting experiences are going to come through people interacting with AI. I think one of the most uh, curious questions I'm curious about is like, how is AI going to change our culture? And I think that it's going to create a new form of media. You know, in the way that video games were different from movies, AI is going to be different from video games. Uh, it's going to be much more useful, much more profound, and much more interesting and engaging and, and helpful. And I think that that's going to um, happen in virtual worlds. And I think that Virtual worlds are gonna make AI smarter, they're gonna make AI more grounded in understanding the problems that we face, and then we're gonna work together to solve problems with AI in virtual worlds. And, and um, you know, for me, this is kind of, uh, you know, the synthesis of a lot of research that's been happening um, that I've been watching at NVIDIA and elsewhere for the past 20 years, and uh, I'm really excited to where that's going next. I, I just love this framing of like, how will AI impact culture? Because I think to me, that is also like by far one of the most important things. Um, about like like I feel like anything you're working on hasn't really hit true utility until it starts impacting culture, and we're already starting to see the early days of that. But it's it's one of the things I love about Brian is like you're like a super like well-rounded person. Like we mo <laughs> like we talk about AI on stage, but like like when we're not doing this, it's like all sorts of all manners of different things about um, and um, that sort of like liberal artsy bent you're taking to all of this is really cool. Oh well, thank you. I mean, I, I feel like it's good to be human. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, we, we have a few minutes for questions. I think there's microphones um, in both aisles. Yeah, go ahead. Software partner for NVIDIA. Let, let's think about uh, some kind of Wintel du dupli, uh, du you know, uh, I think two two dominant player is still better than one. So I want to get uh, Brian's uh, take on who will be the best uh, software partner for NVIDIA. Okay, so and I think NVIDIA c uh, partners with every software entity around the world. You know, we, we work with, with all of them. And so uh, the answer is all of them are going to be successful. We're going to support all of them. You're a great diplomat, amazing. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm also self-interested. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's one of the great joys about the work NVIDIA does that we do support many, many different companies with many different um, perspectives. And, and uh, you know, in that way, as AI uh, prospers, uh, we get, we get to, to kind of uh, ride along. And, and so um, I don't think that in, in NVIDIA would want to choose uh, any, any one as like the most important of our software partners, but, but uh, we, do, we do love working with them. Hi, uh, my name is Vijay. I'm from Dilation Capital from New York. I have a question on scaling loss. Um, you said this, uh, that you have bet on scaling loss uh, in a very uh, successful manner for the last couple of decades. Um, human brain is estimated to have about hundreds of trillions of synapses. Um, given your conviction in scaling loss in the last two decades, how do you view these scaling loss working for the next decade? Um, is the hundreds of trillions of synapses sort of a uh, 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 high watermark, like where these models could eventually go, and what's the risk of overfitting these models? Thank you. I mean, on this one, I feel like 
the whole parameter count thing is a little bit of a megapixel war thing. Yes. Like for the cameras, <laughs> right? Like it's like, hey, I have 15 megapixels, but I have a shitty lens. I still have a bad camera. Um, I feel like it's really ultimately, I think a better um, proxy is actually just the number of flops you've pushed through the model. I think that's a better, like in the near term, I think it's a better measure. But like, I think that in the same way that, um, you know, s every scaling law is ultimately an in, in S-curve. It's like, where are we on, on the S-curve? But I think that like not only is there more to run on the on the pre-training S curve, we have not even started the like what we were loosely earlier talking about like the post-training S curve that much yet, and it's like waiting in the wings to take over for another huge amount of progress over the next uh, over the next while. So I personally am quite bullish that we're going to continue to see um, predictable improvements in progress due to compute and new ideas over the next ten years. Yeah. And, and I would also want to say that um, we still don't understand a lot about how the human brain works. It's really complicated, and reducing it to a number is probably uh, oversimplifying it quite a bit. Um, I think there's a lot of baked-in specialization into the structure of the human brain um, that uh, means that we don't have to learn in the same way that our models do, where we're the, our models are literally started from random numbers. But, th but the human, like each of us, we start with a lot, a lot more um, knowledge that's baked in to the structure of our brains. And I, I think that um, uh, that's hard to quantify and, and understand as well. What we're building with AI is, is quite different. So I don't like um, comparing uh, these numbers because I, I, I don't think ultimately it tells yeah. us very much. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, and uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, chat. I'm glad I was able to attend. Um, you guys mentioned, uh, you know, you, your, your big bet before was like, you know, speed and everything else and updates. In terms of not system level, but like architectures, what is maybe your next big bet that you would do for the next 10 years? For example, I've been interested lately in um, uh, neural symbolic architectures, world models. Yeah. So things like that that are more, that maybe give some some different form to to do, you know, uh, uh, algorithms for the future. So wh what can I pl buy a lottery ticket for <laughs> for the next 10 years? Uh, well, I love, I love world models. I mean, uh, I think we're gonna, we are seeing just amazing progress. And I, I was talking about virtual worlds earlier because of, because of that. I also, I want to put in a big plug for sparsity um, of different kinds. So um, I think that we are about done playing out low precision arithmetic. Uh, we're, we've crunched it down, you know, quite a bit. Um, we're running out of bits, you know. <laughs> so the way to have less bits than one is to go sparse. <laughs> Uh, and so I think we're going to find that we do want to go sparse. We want more structure. Like I was saying earlier, the human brain, there's, I think there's a lot of knowledge that's baked into the structure. It's not an all-to-all -all network, right? Um, and so how, how do we learn how to build um, sparsity into our, into our network so they can be dramatically more um, compute efficient, so like the intelligence per flop can be increased? Uh, I, I think that's, that's going to be a big frontier for us. Uh, plus one to world models. I think if you frame pre-training correctly, world models, I'm um, uh, super hand-waving, but world models kind of pop out for free. And then um, the other one is, um, uh, the other one is um, on the architecture side, um, it's just whatever maps better to hardware. I think it's so much of this is driven by hardware, hardware cycles. Like um, you could have such a clever architecture and just have it not run efficiently. Um, and you'll never be able to scale the thing as well as someone doing something more vanilla that does map to hardware. It's a bitter lesson. Again, <laughs> yeah. All right, so well, I have a question about the pre-training data set and quality. So you were talking about how quality for pre-training data sets is so important for knowledge. Uh, and if you have a bunch of noise, it can really diverge the entire model. But our current methods are already super noisy. We have stuff like at the next stop, take a left, right or go straight, and if the model with our current next token prediction predicts left, but it's right, it's penalized as much as it if it predicts left, or as if it predicts, say, banana, something totally right. random. Yeah. So do you think with our current next token prediction that we'll be able to achieve the kind of next levels of AGI or whatever, or do you think we'll have to go with a different kind of optimization there, and if so, what kind are, are you, again, it's kind of like a, what, should I get a lottery ticket for this one here? What, what kind of like beyond next token prediction yeah. optimizations do you think? Yeah. Well, um, I, first of all, like David was just talking about how the thing that wins is the thing that's easy and scalable and you can dump compute into. And next word prediction has that property, which is why I think it's been so successful. So anything that comes along after ne next word prediction, I think is going to share that property. But the, the second thing that I wanted to say is, um, 
uh, it's hard to know what we should do beyond that next word prediction because um, you know the, these more intelligent, uh, let's say more symbolic approaches like penalizing the model specifically in specific cases, they tend to run into the same problems that other approaches to, to AI have over the past 70 years where the number of cases is just too enormous and we can't enumerate them and when we try, we end up messing it up so the models don't actually learn the, the right thing. And so that's one of the strengths of ne next word prediction is that we can't mess it up with our cleverness. <laughs> um, the, but then the, the third thing I wanted to say about next word prediction is that um, it is tempting to reduce uh, artificial intelligence to flops and, and loss functions and so forth, but um, we can do that biologically as well and just be like, uh, does it make sense that intelligence would come from like amino acids and lipids and like, you know, it, 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 the, the elements can be simple and the um, implication, the elaboration of those elements can be quite complex. And so I, so I don't really feel like uh, the simplicity of nex next word production disqualifies it any more than the simplicity of biochemistry disqualifies it. That's a pretty good analogy. I would also just say like, sometimes I hear um, um, thinking about how architectures work as, you know, will this thing just, W will it, will architecture X be able to do Y? Will like training decision X be able to do Y kind of things? And the answer is always, well, as, as, long, as long as you haven't screwed it up, the answer is always <laughs> yes, it's just how much compute, right? Um, and so like when we go evaluate whether or not any idea is good, we look at does the new idea change either the slope or the intercept of the scaling laws? And, um, and usually the answer is never like, uh, is never like, okay, there's some like straight up discontinuity that only happens if you try some particular architectural idea. Um, so I think as a result of that, it's like, I think many of these things have room for innovation, but um, I don't think that they're like strictly necessary, actually even for us to get to that next level of intelligence. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm really enjoying this and I wanted to uh, bring up a concern I have that uh, dovetails off of your uh, talking about exhausting the available tokens and the multi-dimensionality of intelligence. I come from a uh, education and psychometrics and neuro and uh, neuroscience background. Also did a little AGI back in 2005, long before it was cool. Um, but anyway, as we've kind of run out of the text-based stuff, a lot of people are jumping on the hot buzzword is is synthetic data, and I see that as both an opportunity and a potential real trap um, where where I know from my work in education and human testing and other things like that, that you can get yourself into this solipsistic loop where um, where you're, you're creating very artificial ungrounded uh, um, systems that uh, where where you're getting great results, but uh, but they don't actually mean anything as far as as far as uh, intelligence yeah. and problem solving goes. And I wanted you guys to to talk about opportunities and and dangers there. I just feel like synthetic data is super useful as an augmentation, but it's a crutch because at the end of the day, the underlying complexity of the like generator for synthetic data is usually, at least in my experience, and maybe there's things I don't know about, but it's usually capped. And yeah. at some de degree of model uh, um, uh, of model capacity, you kind of just end up modeling the generator and then you're kind of done. And so the crutch yeah. is over. So I'm curious what you think. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's interesting, you know, in graphics, we've been doing bottom up, um, like let's model every single blade of grass and every light source and every photon and like bounce it all around. And, um, and we've kind of run into the limits there, right? Like I think the future for, for graphics uh, has to be a world model um, because we've run out of ways of enumerating everything else. Mm. And I think synthetic data is kind of a similar thing that, you know, the, the way, just like you were saying, modeling the generator ends up becoming the same problem. Um, and so, so um, I'm a big believer in synthetic data, but I don't, a, and we use it and it, it is important. And uh, yet I don't think that it, um, I mean, to the extent that it's a trap, I think we're all aware of it and, and trying to make sure we don't fall in it. <laughs> 